the tabernacle God directed Moses to make while wandering in the vast deserts of Arabia, the sandy. Leaving no permanent resting place represented mankind in this world of trials, tired, weary, wishing ever for something higher, better. The temple Solomon built to replace the tabernacle permanently resting on Moriah, Jehovah provides. Within the city of Jerusalem, possession of peace was the emblem of heaven, where in beatific vision our souls will rest in everlasting peace. When it was building, it was built of stone hewed and made ready, so there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house when it was building. The temple Solomon the Peaceful built, imaged the universal church, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace built, while the tabernacle represented the Hebrew religion. Whence the Hebrews alone built the tabernacle, but pagan Sidonians and Tyranians aided Solomon to build the temple, to foretell that pagan converts would help Christ and his apostles to build the universal church. God revealed to Moses the model of the tabernacle, and the plans and specifications of the temple came from heaven, the Eternal himself being its architect. For the Divine Son planned and founded the Catholic Church, and David gave to Solomon his son a description of the porch, and of the temple, and of the treasuries, and of the upper floor, and of the inner chambers, and of the house for the mercy seat. All these things, he said, came to me written by the hand of the Lord, that I might understand the works of the pattern. Sole temple of the Lord of hosts, amid the thousand temples of pagan gods, resting on Moriah's top, within the sacred city, vision of heavenly Jerusalem. Terrace upon terrace towered the temple at the time of Christ, dominating high over all the city, except Sion, a loftier hill, the latter emblematic of the church and her Eucharistic sacrifice. Cedar-roofed and richly carved, enclosed by cloisters grandest ever built, its walls of white marble, the sacred fane dominated the city. Copied after the tabernacle of desert wanderings, the temple was divided into four parts, the Holy of Holies, the Holies, the Hebrew courts and the court of Gentiles, each with its own symbolic and prophetic meanings. This was the sacred sanctuary Christ called his Father's house. The inner fane of the holy sanctuary, called by Jewish writers the gold house, was seven stories high and 150 feet square, but within and without was covered with plates of purest gold, bought with money received from the sale of millions of paschal lamb skins. Each plate was a yard square and as thick as a 25 cent piece. Not only walls and sides were gold covered, but even the roof, and it bristled with gold spikes about four inches long to prevent birds settling on and soiling. This golden house was seven-storied, emblematic of the sacred number seven, the word in which the Gospels were later written, and the seven sacraments. In the center was a room thirty feet square, the Holy of Holies, its walls covered with gold plates. This was the resting place of the Holy Ghost of Tabernacle and First Temple. There, visible as a cloud by day, a fire at night, he spoke to Moses, to the prophets, and revealed to them the Old Testament. They called him the Shekinah, the Holy Presence. The Holy of Holies was closed by a great veil, sixty by thirty feet, so thick and heavy it took eight hundred priests to hang it. It was woven of seventy-two colored strands, white, representing waters of baptism, violet, emblematic of penance, red, martyr's blood, and green, youthful innocence. The closed Holy of Holies, dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, represented heaven closed by Adam's sin. To all the members of the seventy-two nations born of Noah's grandsons, except they pass through baptism, penance, martyrdom, or youthful innocence regained. Josephus and Jewish writers say the colors typified water, sky, fire, and earth. The colors are now seen in the church vestments. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the High Priest, typifying Jesus Christ in his death and ascension, 
his hands dripping with blood of victims he had sacrificed in the priest's court. Emblematic of the Jewish church which killed Christ, entered alone that secret place, holiest sanctuary of earth, and there sprinkled the blood to foretell Christ entering and opening heaven to mankind. In the center of the Holy of Holies of Tabernacle and Solomon's Temple rested the Ark of the Covenant, sign of God's contract with the Hebrews. It was a box of sweetly smelling sitim wood, the acacia of Arabia, about three feet long, two wide and high, and covered within and without with plates of purest gold. The cover was edged around with a gold rim, forming the mercy seat of God, the Shekinah. That ark was an emblem of Christ in heaven and on earth, in whom burned the Holy Ghost, with his fire of love moving him to die for the race. In a gold cup, like a ciborium, was preserved some of the miraculous manna, which fell from heaven during the forty years of the wanderings of the Hebrews through Arabia. It reminded them of the food with which the Lord had fed their fathers, and it foretold the Eucharist preserved in the Siborium on our altars with which Christ now feeds Christian souls. Let us see the story of the manna, for one of the cakes of the bread of the Last Supper was named after it. During the desert wanderings, 15,000 pounds of manna a week fell from heaven to feed the Hebrews. One morning they found the ground covered with little grains, like hoarfrost, and when they saw it the first time they exclaimed in Hebrew, Manna, what is this? For forty years God fed them on this miraculous food, till they entered the promised land, to foretell the Eucharistic nourishment of our souls during the wanderings of this life. Every morning, except the Sabbath, the ground was found covered with manna, which had to be gathered before the heat of the sun corrupted it. If a family gathered more than wanted for food during the day, it became offensive, but the double portion found Friday morning for that day, and Saturday did not corrupt. They made the manna into thin cakes like those of the Passover and of the Mass. The third cake Christ consecrated was called the Afikaman, the heavenly manna. A gold ciborium filled with the miraculous manna was placed in the ark to remind them of the miracle. And down the ages it lasted unchanged till Solomon's temple was destroyed. It was a type of the Eucharist reserved on our altars. The Orientals still gather a kind of manna which has not the qualities of that of scripture. It is not a food, but a purgative medicine. It does not fall all the year, but only from May to August. It is found only in small quantities. It keeps for a long time without corruption. A double portion does not fall on Friday. It does not suddenly cease as the miraculous manna did when the Hebrews entered Palestine, when they began to raise their own food. Burkhardt, who traveled extensively through Arabia in 1812, says, Manna in our day is found on the ground, leaves, etc. Must be gathered mornings, for the sun melts it, and it is found only during wet seasons, rarely in dry weather. Strained through a cloth, it is spread on bread like butter or honey, but it is never made into cakes like the Hebrew manna, and in leather bottles will keep for years. The Arabian physician Avicenna says, Mana is collected from the tarfa or tamarisk shrub, Tamarix gallica. It is a dew which falls on stones and bushes, becomes thick like honey, and can be hardened so as to be like grain.